All right, everybody, thanks for uh, coming to my uh, Spinnaker talk, Spinnaker, Land of a Thousand Builds. It's kind of a Caribbean author's old song, Land of a Thousand Dances. Um, I want to do, I got a little short slideshow, and then we're going to actually go into a demo. And um, I'm also glad that we happen to have like three of the other Spinnaker development teams sitting in the audience here. So they'll definitely check me if I say something flagrantly wrong. Just a quick intro, who am I? My name's Greg Turnquist. I'm a member of the Spring team at Pivotal. Uh, I've written a couple books. My latest is uh, Learning Spring Boot, and then there's an actual video tutorial version of that coming later this year, and you can pre-order it right now for like $10. So, uh, shameless plug done. Um, a question, what do you do if you need to do something like, say, deploy 2,000 commits a day? Um, that happens to be like the, the, the release rate that uh, Netflix is using these days. Uh, they make 2,000 updates across their various systems every day. Um, maybe you've moved into microservices. That's a very active topic at a conference like this. You're not, you're, your company's not running a single app. You're running you know, 50 different services, some monolith, some microservice, a lot of different stuff. Um, you need to do things like, you know, well, the, this app needs to scale up, you know, uh, it needs to grow in the number that runs. At, at other times, we need stuff to shrink down. Uh, we need a lot of di variant controls depending on which app we're running. Um, you know, maybe you've gotten a little experience with continuous integration, like using things like Jenkins, but when it comes time to actually deploy the artifact, you have something like I used to have at my old job, a 23-page standard operating procedure to actually carry that out, where you know, there's a lot of different stakeholders, there's QA, configuration management people that all want to sign off and carry out a complex deployment process. Um, my, my investment broker has a saying, the person with the most options wins, and anytime I talk to customers, they want to know what are the options. Um, maybe you're, you know, Hopefully you're, you're a good person and you're using Pivotal Cloud Foundry, but perhaps you're also using AWS or using it at, at Google or Microsoft Azure or you know, Kubernetes. You want options on, I don't want to get locked into this one cloud and I want to be able to deploy to different clouds. And I want to be able to use the same tool set. So instead of having to learn a completely new paradigm, can I leverage what I've already learned and you know, if, I need to, if I need to jump ship and go to another cloud provider? So, you know, that's sort of the what if pie in the sky idea about, oh, those, those are nice goals to have. Do I really need that or not? And so I, I went and did a little math and added up that um, maybe you have a single, you know, maybe you do have a single monolith app and, and your company's at the point where we can do a quarterly deployment. Um, and you're like, well, you know, maybe we have to get the whole dev team on site once every three months. That's not preferable, but it's no big deal. I mean, we, can, we, we, we do that. But you've moved into microservices, and now you're like, okay, we're, we want to deploy once a day. Well, if you do the math on that, you, that becomes 900 times whatever that first effort was. Now, if you bump things up and start going to like, we're going to do 10 commits a day to each of these services as, you know, developers start to realize, hey, I can roll out smaller changes, I can minimize risk if I can speed up the turnaround time, it becomes a factor of 9,000. And if you move up to 20 services uh, 50, with 50 commits a day, it's suddenly 90,000 times whatever that cost was. So now you suddenly have a real problem on your hands. And you may find out that this 23-page process that you've been running with has serious flaws that need to be ironed out. So the solution to all this, if the hint wasn't hard enough, is Spinnaker. Spinnaker is a pipeline-based engine that lets you deploy to multiple clouds in the same pipeline. It's not a, uh, I'm gonna install it for AWS, or I'm gonna install it for Pivotal Cloud Foundry or one of these other cloud providers on my chart. Instead, it's a, um, I can set it up to work with all of these clouds if I really wanted to, and from within the same pipeline with the same set of tools, I can have, you know, one pipeline deploys to Pivotal Cloud Foundry and another step can deploy to a totally different cloud if you really want to do that. Um, it is a, it's called a, I call it a multi-stage. It has several, you know, the, the big steps that we have are called stages and it comes with multiple triggers involved. A trigger is what you use to kick off a pipeline. So you can detect 
a new job that is just run on uh, Jenkins, if that's what you're using for a CI, which is Jenkins is highly adopted in the enterprise. Uh, you could be, you can also opt to use Travis. Um, there's other things like uh, you can have cron jobs kick it off. Um, you can detect if GitHub is, you know, GitHub can be your triggering mechanism, or you can manually kick off pipelines if you really want to do that. Uh, there's, there's a whole lot of operations that are pre-built, sort of pre-built opinions in Spinnaker. One of uh, like find images. A find image says, I want to deploy this, but what I want to deploy is what got deployed over there in staging. Go find out what got deployed there, and I want to put the same thing over here. Uh, got deploy, which is sort of the, the core thing of what we're talking about here, is actually you know, released to production. Uh, you can have what are called manual judgments. You need the, I need this pipeline to stop right here and have a human step in and confirm this step. So this could be, this is a critical step. We're not going to let this go to production unless a human checks it out. Or this is a step that QA said they will not let pass unless, you know, one of the QA people comes in and signs it off. And who knows, maybe they do federal stuff and they want to print out a, a document and stamp it like the old days. Whatever, you have the option to do that. Um, you, can, you can resize deployments, you know, you can start with it rolled out one, I need it to scale up and run 10 copies, or I need it to shrink back down. Um, and then you can enable, disable, roll back, roll forward, these kind of options with zero downtime. And this is something where Spinnaker is able to make use of whatever platform that it's on, such as Pivotal Cloud Foundry, and really leverage zero downtime stuff, which is definitely a critical thing in this day and age. And then finally, it comes with a lot of options for notifications. Um, you can have, you know, at various steps in the pipeline, you can have it email uh, key people. Uh, maybe it needs to, maybe your QA person that wants their manual step alerted, um, maybe they're, you know, hip and cool and they're on Slack. You can send them a Slack message. Or maybe they're not hip and cool and not on Slack. Send them an email or a page. And then you can also have it ping other people, or if you have a Firehose channel in Slack, you know, you can have all your pipelines routing traffic in there just to keep alert as to what's happening. So with that, I'm going to switch over to a demo, and let me uh, exit out here. So... What I have here is this is a instance of Spinnaker, and this instance is actually installed on uh, Pivotal Web Services, or like as we'd like to call it, PDubs. So it's installed on uh, Pivotal Web Services, and it's set up to deploy applications to Pivotal Web Services. And uh, what I have here is I have a single application I use for demonstration. I call it uh, SDR demo. This is, this is short for Spring Data Rest Demo because I also happen to work on the Spring Data team. And it's a, it's a, arguably it's a monolithic app that's very small and uh, easy to deploy. But uh, what, I, what I have here is um, I'm going to start from a, uh, an, an sort of an ops perspective. Uh, I used to work at a shop where we, had, we monitored like 8,000 sites. We had 300,000 pieces of equipment. And what the ops people were constantly needing to know is, hey, I have an error, I have an issue here, I want to zoom in on this perspective and, f and get this other stuff out of view. So in this case, I can pick this application because I'm interested in what's the status of this thing from a deployment perspective. So I can pick the app and you can see it in the top left corner here. And this is showing me what's the status of this app in production and don't show me anything else right now. You know, it's possible to come over here and filter on stuff um, but uh, before I show the filtering, I'm going to kind of explain what, what is all this information we're looking at right now. What we have are uh, called clusters. Now, maybe, you know, 10, 15 years ago, what a cluster was was a, was a piece of hardware. You basically had two servers, and you, you had software on one or the other. You may have had the same version on both of them, and there was a load balancer in front of it. And you essentially told the, you know, you told the cluster either you're active on this side or you're active over here. And when you would do an upgrade, you know, you're pointing at this copy, you upgrade the other copy and then switch over to it. That's how clusters operated in the olden days. Today, I'm, I have a, a virtually the same concept here. I have two different clusters. The one up here at the top, this is my SDR demo application, and this is my production version of it. 
I've labeled it with this tag in the middle. You can see it says dash production. It's kind of, it's basically a logical label so I can differentiate it from the other copy of my app that I'm using for staging. And in this case, this is all running inside a Pivotal Web Services space that's hosting other applications my other teammates are working on. So I added a little freeform detailed entry just to flag it with my own user ID. So if anybody else goes into PDubs and looks at it, they're gonna know, oh, that's, that's Greg's app, let's leave that one alone. And this whole thing defines effectively what we call a cluster. So that, that's sort of an application where, that's something where traffic can route into. People can go ping that particular cluster and interact with it as an application. Inside this cluster here, we have two versions. Right now we have, we have version eight, which is disabled. It's the, the icon is grayed out. There's no little green chiclet underneath it, so there's zero instances of it running on Cloud Foundry. And um, I don't know if you can tell, but that's actually a little Cloud Foundry icon. Um, it's a little, it's a little clipped at the top, but uh, if you deploy other things, like if you use Kubernetes, if you use AWS, they'll put in their icon. So at a glance, you can tell, oh, that's a Cloud Foundry deployed app. And then up here, I have version nine deployed. Its state is green. It has one little green chiclet telling me there's one instance actually running to this app. Let me zoom back out. And if I look over here, if you notice when I click this thing over here, I get a little, let me, if I can, it's not gonna let me scroll over here. Okay, it's, there's a little bit of details over here. And what I can do is I can scroll down and find a hyperlink that says, I wanna, go to the, I wanna go to the app manager perspective on P-dubs and look at that thing. So if I click that, it's going to take me over to where it's actually located in Pivotal Web Services. All right, log me in. All right, just give me a moment to fetch it. Okay, and what we see here is, this is the whole thing we're looking at. SDR demo, the name of the application from a Spinnaker perspective. The stack that I'm using, this is the production ver variant. This is my freeform entry. Here I'm putting gturnquist. If I was deploying, say, a microservice, I could have called this something else like uh, circuit breaker service discovery, back end, front end, something like that to describe what its actual role is. And then finally the exact version of it that I have deployed. So between these two copies, there's another little icon right here called the load balancer. Now if I click on that, let me zoom back out, it's a little bit cut off, but what this, is, what this is listing are actually these two server groups. And what we have here is a URL down in the corner. It doesn't look real good. Um, what that is, is that is, a, uh, that is a route that's mapped on the platform between both of those versions. So essentially, this is, my public, this is the public facing URL to go navigate to that cluster. So if I, if I click on that, it takes me here to springdatarestdemo.cfapps.io. And this is, I, I said a Spring Data REST app, this is what Spring Data REST looks like. It's, it's basically a, a RESTful URL that you can go hang a front end off of. Now down here I have another one, this is my staging copy that I happen to be running. Down here I have, a sing I have one version of this and it happens to be version 12. So if I click on this one's load balancer and I can go navigate to this, um, this is spring data rest demo dash stagingcfappsio and I can go see this. So essentially I have two different copies of this app visible in two places. And so this is sort of my, this is the current state that I have everything in right now but what I want to do is get to the more interesting stuff, and that would be a pipeline deployment. So what I can do is I can go click over here and look at my various pipelines that I have. What I'm gonna do is unpin this to slide it over here. Uh, 
There we go. Is that better? <sighs> okay, so what I have is here, I have a handful of pipelines. Um, the first one I have here is called deploy to staging. If I actually pop this thing open here, I can see what the steps are up here. Um, this is where I can define the opening step is what triggers this pipeline. And for demonstration purposes, I have this just rigged to be for manual deployment, but this would be a keen place to say, I want this triggered by a Jenkins job. When Jenkins finishes a build job and generates and publishes a new artifact, I want to deploy that artifact immediately to a staging environment where somebody can go do some variant of testing against it to check it out. So if I click on the second stage here, this is deployed to staging. Um, down here, this actually says, well, you're going to deploy, what do you want to deploy exactly? What this says is I'm going to, I happen to be running both my staging and my production copy inside the same space on P-dubs, but it's actually up to you what you want to do. You could have totally different spaces. I could have a production space and I could have a staging space. I could even have these on two instances of PCF that are set up in, in different areas if I wanted to do that. But for demonstration purposes, it's all just running inside one space. I can actually go, if I go into this server group definition, and this is where I get to pick which, which account. This essentially says which space in P PCF do I want to install this on. This is where I get to enter that logical label of staging and, and freeform detail here. And then I can pick which kind of strategy do I want. Right now, it's not, it's not employing any strategy, so it's going to deploy it, and when it's confirmed that it's up, it'll be done with it. But you can actually pick, you can pick the Highlander strategy, which says that once you've deployed the new copy and it's successful, destroy all its predecessors because there can be only one. And then finally, you can pick the more sophisticated red-black strategy, which says I want to... I want to keep the newest copy and a certain number of uh, predecessors, like perhaps I want to keep one, pre one previous copy around in case I need to do a rollback. Or if, you know, for a very conservative shop, maybe you want to keep five copies before it if you need to back up a certain number. Now we talked about load balancers. Um, because Spinnaker is designed to run on multiple clouds, uh, if you go to places like uh, AWS, you create things like elastic load balancers. So if you had picked a AWS account, the actual details here would be very different because you would be entering AWS specific settings. And in that case, you need to go configure elastic load balancers, you have to give them IP addresses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for Cloud Foundry, all we need for a load balancer is the name of a host name because that's what we're gonna map onto each copy that we deploy. And then down here, this is what I'm going to deploy. And in this case, my artifact happens to live out on S3. So this is the, the path of the location and the actual artifact. Because uh, in another demo, I actually had uh, like four different microservice jars built that happened to be in the same folder. So I could say, I need to go to this one path at the top and grab this exact artifact. And in this case, I don't, I don't have to type in the credentials here because they're linked to the account. Um, this is a Cloud Foundry uh, solution, so do you need to bind any services when you do a deployment? You can list your you know, service. You know, if you had some SQL, MySQL database service that you've created in your environment, you can enter it here. And then do you need any, do you need any custom environment variables applied to your app when it rolls out to production? So, Especially if you're using Spring Boot to build all your apps, which is the way to go, then you can enter in any overrides that you need to do here. And finally, you can pick your, you know, if you need to override the default build pack that it's going to use. So if you were here at the last session and heard Ben Hale talking about uh, build pack stuff, here's where you could go put your forked build pack, for instance, you know, and set any uh, memory overrides, for instance. <clears throat> So essentially, this is all the things to find my server group. Now, at this point, I have one server group here. It's, it's, it's really up to you. Do you, you know, if you, have, you could actually have multiple server groups deployed here, or you could create multiple deployment stages and have each of them do a different module if you're doing a microservice. Or maybe that's a whole separate pipeline because that's a separate team that's building the other microservice, and they need their own pipeline. So again, like I said, it's options, and you can pick which option suits you best. 
Some of the stuff that you can pick from is, for instance, you know, if you want to restrict, you know, this deployment only happens between this window time frame. For example, I, I know a certain company that will say, well, this particular app, we're not actually going to upgrade on the eastern seaboard during prime time uh, viewing. Instead, it has to be delayed two hours or something like that. So these are options if you need to uh, control when these things go out. Um, you know, I mentioned about notifications. You can have notifications at this stage, and you can have as many as you want to define. So, you know, do you need to post a, you know, do you need to specify a Slack channel to send a message out to, and, you know, what kind of notification are you talking about sending out here? Like a, when it's starting, when it's completed, all of the above. And then finally, down here, you have the option to enter in a spell expression. If you want to find out more about uh, all the power you can do is you need to go to this guy's talk over here tomorrow on uh, spell expressions. And I'll mention that at the end of the talk. So it's a lot of options for a, a complex rollout. So in this demonstration, what I'm going to do is I'm spending a lot of time on, on the, the first pipeline, and then I want to kick off the demo, and we can see what's happening as it goes. What we're actually going to do is um, I want to launch it into staging, but the situation I have is I want to route 20% of the traffic to the new copy. So we can do a little bit of t partial testing. Is the new copy adequate? Is it, does it show degradation of performance? If it's good enough, then we can move forward and roll and move it on out to production. So in this case, the trickery you pull with Pivotal Cloud Foundry is you can say, I'm going to spin up four copies of the old one and just have one of the new one, and it will load balance automatically. And that one out of five requests will route to the new copy. So to do this, I'm going to actually do a, uh, I'm going to scale this item. If you zoom in, this is a resize server group operation. And I'm going to go find the previous server group and scale it to exactly four copies. But this is where you, can, you have other options. Do I want to scale the newest server group, the previous one, the oldest one? Um, And then at that point, you know, that will be the completion of my deploy to staging pipeline. So what I'm going to do is go ahead, I'm going to kick that off, and then I'm going to just keep talking. So what you saw up there a minute ago is that you saw a green bar. That was a previous run that I did about an hour and a half ago, just to make sure everything was running perfectly. But uh, while this copy is running, I can sit there and actually click on it and look at what the status of this thing is. You know, it shows, me, it shows me what's in this particular instance of the pipeline. It has deployed to staging followed by that route 20% traffic. Um, you know, it has information here. I can actually click on this sub tab here, and it shows me what are the exact tasks that it's going to carry out doing a deployment. Um, you know, it's actually going to, it's, it's going to figure out what's the version that it's going to deploy. It's going to deploy it and watch it as it's, as it's essentially doing a CF push operation, and then it's going to update the cache uh, that monitors it. So we don't have an update yet. And usually for this demo, the thing takes about 10, 11 minutes to run all four of these pipelines, one after the other. Uh, I like this feature here. It actually shows me how much time is on each individual step. But uh, you know, you can tell it to say, "I want to see, I want to see the last ten pipelines that operated." Okay, so now we're into the force force a cache refresh operation. Let's see if it's updated the cluster page. So down here, now I can see that um, version twelve is what I had beforehand. It's in the middle of pushing out, rolling out version thirteen. And then it should be mapping the route onto it. I can actually click this instance if I want to go uh, get a little bit extra data. But um, in this case, I can actually navigate. You know, do I want to see what this thing is in the in P dubs right now? So here's where it's it's pushing out version 14. I actually have the you know right here from P dubs. I can go monitor the logs on it. It's pretty wide. So, you know, it's okay, it started, it's, it started my app. Good, all right. Yeah. 
you know, here it's, it's, it's in flight, so if I hover over this, it'll show me the status of the, uh, this pipeline that it's in the middle of. So it should be just about done here. When I click on here, now it gives me a link to show me, well, we just deployed version 13. You know, do you want to go see that? And I can click on that, and it'll take me back to the cluster view, but it will automatically switch on all these filters to show me just this version that I clicked on. So, so now it's finished deploying the staging. It's now doing this, my rebalancing act here, where it's going to scale up four copies of the older version. So it's gone and it's figured out that it needs to go after version 12 and do the scaling operation. So let's see if it's uh... So in this case, it's the middle of doing a uh, resize. Let's see if it's... Okay, so... So here's the staging copy. So now you can see that I have uh, version 12 now has four copies running. And this is where I can see the number of instances running on PDubs. And it tells, it's giving me the exact status. Three of the four copies are up. One of these is still in startup mode. But this is basically a CF uh, scaling operation. Okay, it's got all four, it's, it's got all four up now and it's got the, this one here. So it should finish this about any second. There you go, so that's green, so it's completed this pipeline. Now what's gonna happen is, is my, next my next pipeline that I have lined up here is called an automated canary test. So uh, if you're not familiar, canaries are what they, they put in the coal mines to detect gas leaks early on so they could know to get the miners out. So this is a check that I've put in to go you know, check it out, compare version one, you know, the first version against the first, second version and see what the issue, you know, are there any issues with it or does it seem to be working just fine? Um, I actually put in a manual pause here because I wanted to show my sort of uh, hybrid idea of a canary check ahead of actually writing a real one. So it says go look at this here. So I've created like a little test app called Spring Cloud Canary. And what this thing is doing, it's actually looking at the both versions of it and it's looking up their Spring Boot metrics. And its criteria says, you know, is the new server's memory attribute within 50% of the old one, you know, versus do we have a memory spike? And it says it is. And then over here it says, what about, what about mem.free? What about uh, threads? And essentially these three things, it, it adds them all together and it gives me a, a combinatorial status of saying, okay, that looks good enough to me based on these criteria, so it's, it's up. So I'm gonna tell it to continue on, and it's essentially gonna, this, this step over here, check preconditions, is doing that automatically. It essentially says, go run that canary check, and if you see a value of up, move forward. If you don't see a value of up, stop. Don't go to production, because there's something wrong with it. And that would be a good candidate for send a notification to the development team. You know, alert the development team that you just rolled something out and it broke. In this case, it did not break. So instead, it, it presses on with deploy to production. So when you go to production, this is a keen example of, okay, it looked good. I want to deploy to production what just got deployed to staging. I shouldn't have to type in that, that artifact. Instead, I should be able to say, what, what copy is out there in staging? And give me the details, and I'll install the same thing. So if we look in this pipeline's definition, I have here find staging's cop, uh, copy. This is what a find image operation does. Right here, I can say, look in this account, my production account, my, my, uh, the prod space that I'm working in. Look for this cluster, SDR demo dash staging dash G Turnquist. Look at that one and go find me the newest server group. And basically, take that information and put it into the pipeline for the next stage to take advantage of it. So if I go over here to deploy to production, this is going to look very similar to the other deployment step. Except, first of all, this one is using the red-black strategy. Use red-black 
I want two copies at all times, the newest being active, the old one being disabled. But down here, I don't need to specify the artifact because instead it's being implicitly supplied by the previous stage. It already looked up what version of artifact I want to deploy. And then I'm not doing any other overrides. And deploy that. Okay, so, oh, wrong, oh yeah. Okay, so deploy to production. So I can click here on find staging's copy and what's gonna show me is uh, if I scroll down here, uh, each of these stages can uh, serve up results and it's gonna tell me this is, the, this is what we go found, so this is what we're gonna go deploy. Oop. So you can see some of the same data that I had entered in the previous step. Now something that I've kind of glossed over here is the fact that, um, let me get your question in a second, um, is that uh, if this was actually a Jenkins build, you know, if I was being tipped off by Jenkins having kicked off a job, I would actually have access to the job name and the job ID. And the idea is um, the path to the artifact would probably have that in the path of it. So you can actually put that as templated variables so that when you have job 11, job 12, job 13, you're, gonna, you're looking at a different place in your artifact repository to actually pull down an artifact. But for this demo, I just happen to have the version number hard-coded into it. Um, So what it is, it went and found that image, and now it's actually, it's doing another deployment step. This one's, uh, this one's a little more sophisticated because I turned on the red-black strategy. So, I don't know why it keeps scrolling up, but, um, you know, the previous one had the deploy step, but the deployment, it says it succeeded, but it's now on to the next step, shrink cluster. So here's the step where, okay, I had two server groups. Let's see if I can catch it in the act. Okay, yes, so in production here, I was up to the point where I, you know, I had, I now have more than one group. I'm up from two to three, 10 being active, nine being inactive, and you saw eight for a second there was available. So what it was doing was saying, get rid of the oldest copy. So that was, that reduces it back down to two copies. And then the last task it's gonna execute is now disable the old copy. So that'll route all the traffic in production to the new copy. And the whole time, because we're using the routes from PCF, et cetera, we're able to do this with zero downtime. Do you have a question over here? Okay. So the last step it's doing is a disable cluster, which is essentially like a CF stop. Say that again. Okay, so the question is, is between staging and between the production, the version numbers don't appear to correspond. Like there's no, Version, version nine in staging does not mean the same thing as version nine in production, and that, that is correct. So um, what this is using is a concept called immutable infrastructure. So the, uh, the fundamental concept is, is um, if I'm gonna push out a new version, I'm gonna roll out a completely new Cloud Foundry application. You notice when I navigated to uh, App Manager, it had the version number embedded in, my, in the name of the application, like V009. Um, the idea is, well, if there's something wrong with V009 that, that I, I missed and got rolled out there, I don't go and push a new copy to V009, I, put, I go ahead and roll out V010. So instead of fiddling with updating old copies of apps, I just keep rolling out a new one and I increment the number. And the whole thing is, is when you increment the numbers when you actually do a deployment. So version 10 in staging has no correlation to version 10 in production from a, from a management perspective. Uh, What's not, what's not clearly shown here is that there's additional metadata gathered when you're using, for instance, Jenkins or Travis. Not only do you have the job ID and the job name included with the metadata, but it will also look up, for instance, the GitHub commit ID that is involved with that. So it gathers all this metadata, so you can, you can click on you know, V012 and say, it'll give you a link back to Jenkins so you can see the job that ran. It'll also give you the, the SHA value of the GitHub commit that was tied to it. So you can go back to your source code and see what version is that running there. But essentially the, the numbering in production is to, main, to make sure we have unique copies running. And then they're all, uh, you know, and then we have routes mapped onto them to route traffic in. So nobody, no user has to go and type V012 into their browser to navigate to your app. Um, is that clear? 
So, okay, deploy to production just finished. <laughs> Successfully. And now it's doing what I call the, the cleanup staging task. So essentially this says go back, well, we can look at what it says. I, I really like the UI on this thing. <laughs> Oh, okay, so you can just jump to it. Um, so this one essentially just says, go to SDR demo staging G Turnquist and shrink it down to one server group, keeping the newest one, and allow deletion of active server groups. So essentially I'm saying in this case, in this case I, I would, I, you know, staging, I don't need to keep as many copies around because it's really just to check out the latest stuff, um, but, in this case, I'm not using, I, I could use a Highlander strategy, like every time I go to staging, you know, kill all the old stuff just so we can conserve resources. But the fact is I want to do an automated canary check, so I don't want to clean anything up until we're done with the whole process. And this also lets it be that uh, if the canary check failed, I still have the, the first and the second version sitting in staging if I need to do any post-mortem analysis on it. But again, you know, this is, this is the, the pipeline I've defined that meets my operational needs. Um, you know, any one of these pipelines, you know, we were, we were talking at the beginning of the thing about having a 23-page deployment procedure, and you can go and say, well, in this pipeline, I'm going to have a few manual judgments. Like, I need to have, here's a step I'm going to stop and let QA come in and do their manual test procedure if they want to. Um, you know, and at the same time, there may be another team that wants to do smoke testing. Like, maybe the integration team gets alerted. They go out, they do smoke testing. QA team can do their testing in parallel. When both of them say that that's okay, you can move forward and, you know, plug in maybe your automated canary testing. Um, the reason I like that kind of approach is, is like, let's go capture whatever this complex procedure is and put it in the pipeline and start using it. You know, if QA... If QA gets loaded up with, with 20 emails a day saying, hey, new releases out, go check it out, new releases out, go check it out, new releases out, go check it out, it kind of shines a light on the process and they can either say, we need to fix this process, this is very inefficient, and they can decide, you know, we don't, this is not the approach we need, let's go back and alter the, our pipeline, let's update it, or they can say, no, that's exactly the oversight we're looking for. We have a nice email record of what's happening, the, the customer likes having this kind of stuff, and it, you know, it gives you the power to trace everything that in your deployment process, if that's what you want to do. So the, the cleanup process is uh, finished up here, so now the, the staging is back to just the latest copy. So this is what I call sort of a, a, a this is a simplistic demo of a complex process. You know, I could have gone and made this a lot more complex to, to illustrate it, but you know, we don't want to get lost in, in a uh, demo, if you will. Um, the other part that I'm not as fluent with is that um, uh, I would also see it being uh, feasible to go put all these different pipelines, really make one big complex pipeline with lots of branches. Um, but what I don't not have as much experience with is from an ops perspective, you know, if you're going along this one pipeline and you have a failure, you know, can you route through this other branch and still achieve the same effects that you're looking for? Or is it, is it more effective to break everything up into little tiny pipelines um, that you want to manage? And, you know, in this, in this perspective, I can go into any one of these pipelines and I can actually, here's the, yeah, there's, there's an actual link to a document behind the pipeline that stores the entire state of the pipeline of what happened. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, is what about access control? Is there restrictions on who can do what to which pipelines or et cetera? And um, initially there's zero access. What uh, Google has actually invested a lot of effort in writing first uh, an authentication level, an OAuth-based uh, authentication module, and they also have a SAML-based authentication module to first uh, authenticate, and then they're, they're instituting some authorization checks. So it's kind of an in-progress effort, and that's definitely something I know when you go into enterprise shops that they want to ask about, can we constrict you know, these operations to these teams? And I'm in the middle of um, understanding what's been implemented so far to be able to turn it on for the, the PCF version of this. Um, 
So it's, it's definitely an in-progress task. Okay, so the question is, if I understand it, is um, if I have a two if I have a two stage pipeline, like um, I'm triggered by a Jenkins job, I'm going to do a deployment. After the deployment, I want to run a Jenkins job, like to do some form of like testing or something. Like you have a Jenkins job to yeah, like to exercise it. So by default, when you put the two stages one, one in serial, it's going to wait for the first stage to finish before it goes to the second stage. But you can actually, there is a stage in there that you can introduce a time delay. You can say, I want to do the staging task. I want to wait one hour. Then I want to run the Jenkins test job for, because maybe you need to accumulate an hour's worth of ops data, for instance, in the system to actually do a meaningful test case. Does that, does that kind of answer your question? Well, you can institute that as well. Um, you can put uh, precondition checks in there with, uh, you, can, you can essentially write a spell expression. And for instance, if you're using a Spring Boot app that has actuator switched on, it has, it has the health indicator to report up. You can essentially write a, a HTTP expression to query for that and say, when I see that, I'm only gonna move forward if I see a status of up. And that's kind of in a nutshell what I put into that canary test. So I just want to repeat what he said so we can have it in the recording is uh, Spinnaker does have built-in support for things like Eureka-based health checks or console-based health checks. So, you know, it, it'll integrate and check that stuff if you're using like Spring Cloud Netflix for Eureka support, for instance, with your app. Um, did I see a question back in the back there? Okay, so the question is, uh, if, you're, if your target platform is you're deploying to AWS and you have things like uh, VPCs with uh, subnets, et cetera, and I would immediately say I have almost zero experience with AWS, but Spinnaker was actually built first to run AWS builds, so the Netflix people have um, extensive settings to support various AWS operations and uh, the ELBs and stuff like that. and. Um, I'd actually find these guys like after the talk and, and they can actually go into a lot more detail about the support for that. <laughs> so look for the black shirts that say Netflix. Um, I guess to one, one metric that I love to throw out at customers is that they have about like 2,000 commits a day, I think, to all the, the systems and about 75% of their services, et cetera, are now today using Spinnaker as their uh, continuous deployment platform of choice. Okay, so the question is, is Spinnaker available in the marketplace? And we're talking about the Cloud Foundry marketplace. Uh, we're in the middle of building, what you could say we're building a tile, but the, what we're doing is, um, we're building an app here. I'm gonna pull up a copy of it. Oh, I can type it. Um, this is what I call the Spinnaker deployer. Uh, it, it looks, if, you've, if, if anybody here has installed a tile, this looks a lot like it because I went and ripped off the CSS to make it look like a tile. Um, right now, today, this is a Spring Boot app that I wrote that uses the CF Java client library and it essentially, it will install Spinnaker uh, into, a, into any Cloud Foundry instance, assuming you provide it the, the settings. You know, you need to give it the credentials of what spaces it's gonna to connect to a space to log in. Um, so this is what we have is, we, I call this the one-click deployer for Spinnaker for CF solutions. 
And so the, the, the idea is we're trying to build this to make it as easy as possible to put it into customers' hands to get feedback so that we can eventually wrap this thing in a tile and so you can take it out to PCF. Like right now, this, ha this copy is running in PDUB, so it's publicly visible. This copy can't see your PCF if it's in a local data center or behind a VPN. But the idea is to eventually wrap this thing up in a tile so you can carry it into your data center and then install Spinnaker using this. So the question is, when are we getting that? That one I don't have a firm answer on. So um, my suggestion is, is at least if you want to get familiar with it, come um, and it's in my one of my last slides on my talk is to please visit spinnaker-deployer.cfapps.io to to check it out. And I'll answer your question here after I show you the uh, not deployer um, uh, Spring Cloud Spinnaker. And it's all captured in an open source project called Spring Cloud Spinnaker is what that, where that app is located with some information on how to build it. Um, uh, you, Okay, so the question is, is um, you know, with the Jenkins DSL, and I'm, I'm aware of Jenkins 2.0 coming with pipeline support and stuff, um, so is there any way to like sort of reconcile what they're doing with pipelining versus what is Spinnaker offering and pipelining when it comes to, you know, we want to do some degree of uh, building and testing and checking it out before we actually roll it out to production. And to me, it's kind of a, it's kind of a choice you want to make if, you could, you could continue to use Jenkins on that behalf. Um, if you want to do with that, you could say, you know, I'm, I'm going to let Jenkins do the building stuff and I'm going to let Spinnaker actually do the deployment to the cloud. Because um, I think, I feel like the Spinnaker, when you're talking about, I need to, I want to push this into a staging space of the cloud, which is the, to me, would be the closest thing to the actual production environment you're going to be in. Um, that's where Spinnaker really shines at being able to let you do the same thing you would do in production. Um, uh, now, as to whether uh, can Spinnaker read a Jenkins DSL is uh, I don't I don't know if that's on any radar screen for using that or not. I don't. Uh, yeah. Um, the other I don't know the the other auxiliary question I do get from people is uh, like if I'm in this pipeline, for instance. Uh, so far what I've shown you is sort of a UI-based configuration, which this, this is really nice. I kind of like this UI, but you actually do have the ability to see that, you know, it's actually a big piece of JSON that's stored out in a data store. So you can actually grab your pipeline and pull it out. You, you can edit it. I don't recommend that you edit it. I've used this more so to fix bugs in, in the uh, CF support stuff where it, it put faults into the uh, pipeline. But it's possible to go grab pull out your pipelines and go stick them somewhere more permanent if you need to preserve that kind of data. Uh, something that's not built into the platform yet is say, I want to version control my pipelines. So I want to edit it and commit that, commit that change. But I'm sure I, I run into customers and that's one of their questions is, is how do I version control my pipelines? So that's to me, that to me is an open discussion that uh, I think many people are interested in. If we had any other, hmm. Okay, so the question is, what about what about other CI solutions? Are there some plans for support for that, like uh, Concourse CI? And uh, today we today there's support for I mentioned um, Jenkins, Travis. Uh, I actually was chatting with the, one of my teammates two nights ago, and his comment was, "Well, implement support for Circle CI, and you're done." <laughs> Essentially, it's not, it's not hard to add support for those things because all these things have RESTful API. So essentially, uh, the, the component of Spinnaker that is polling those systems, it's, it's pretty much just you know, pinging the system to detect if there's been a new build job. So it's not hard to add support for that. And um, Concourse has its own API to, to talk to. And so I feel like if, I, you know, if we put this in enough customers' hands, if I, 
you know, if enough customers say, hey, we want to use Concourse for CI, we want to use Spin Spinnaker for CD, I, I don't see any problem with proceeding with that. We just haven't made that a top priority item to go implement that yet. You know, Travis support was added by a customer because Travis has gotten real popular. Um, you know, ne Netflix uses Jenkins, so they added Jenkins support, but they're they're very open to community contributions like that. And every day I'm having to. Um, I see a question over here. So the question is, is uh, how extensible is it to add your own target location to deploy to? And um, I'm not going to say like how easy or hard that is because it takes some amount of effort, but the, uh, I think the, the current, like most active stuff that's being added is OpenStack support. So when I started working on this, um, Microsoft had not yet joined the Spinnaker team, if you will, the community. But since that time, I've seen Microsoft come on board and write a whole bunch of code to add Azure support. So you can, the thing can talk directly to Azure. Uh, OpenStack is, I think they've, they've probably done the bulk of it by now. They've been very active. I don't know how many people they have over there working on it. Um, I don't know, it's, it's slightly on the embarrassing side. I'm the one person at Pivotal that's been writing the Cloud Foundry support, which is why my part has been slower. Um, but basically, they're very open to community contribution. So if there's another cloud solution that essentially has the same concepts of you know, deployment, enable, disable, scale up, scale down, um, basically, you, you come in and you write those operations and you then inherit the rest of the ecosystem of Spinnaker, like all the, the, you don't have to go write pipeline code, you just need to write these core operations that probably map to about any cloud provider. Let's see here. Um, I'm going to put up here. I said I didn't have a lot of slides, it's really demo oriented, and I wanted to put a link up here. Uh, if you want to go check it out, the spinnaker-deployer.cfapps.io app, go, go take a look at that. Um, again, I have, you know, Spring Cloud Spinnaker is what's behind that. There's also a, a talk tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. from uh, Thomas Lynn about putting, putting a spell on Spinnaker and actually discovering the, um, the power that you can get out of spell expressions in various parts of your pipelines. And, you know, I've actually put that to good use. Um, there, we don't, the, the Canary API is not quite available yet for us to hang stuff off of, but I was able to sort of shoehorn in a Canary test using a spell expression. So, you know, the fun thing is Spinnaker is all written in Spring Boot and Groovy, so it's, just, it's a bunch of Spring apps running, so it's very, very familiar uh, programming paradigm to jump into if you're a Spring developer. Okay, so the question is if, uh, so if you're using Jenkins as your uh, CI deployment tool, um, what assumptions is Spinnaker making on that? Do you have to include any specific plugins or any tricks or things like that? And fundamentally, all you need to do is you need to give it the root URL for where, for the REST API to say this, this is where you go to, to ping, you know, essentially curl for jobs. And you have to give it uh, the tokens, like you have to go in there and have it generate an OAuth token. So that's the piece where how you can pull Jenkins to detect if it's done a job. Uh, the other assumption is um, don't, don't pull artifacts from your CI server because you can configure it where you're like, jobs that are three months old or older, I want cleaned off of my CI server so that it doesn't get overloaded. So the assumption is, well, the job finished and I get a signal from that. Now let me go to the, artif let me go to the repository that it published to. So there's an assumption that, well, I'm going to have this artifact published to, say, Artifactory, or I'm going to have it published to S3. And so there, it's kind of like you can choose what you want. I, my demo, I, I had I'd installed the S3 plugin, which was very easy, and told it to publish to a certain location. And then in my pipeline, I said, look there. So that's kind of the only assumption that uh, it makes with that regards. Um, I think I'd seen somebody, somebody else was asking about a, 
they were using some other plugins. I didn't, I'm not very fluent in the Jenkins plugin community. There's about like 10 billion plugins for that. And they were wanting to, there was like plugins to deal with a, a totally different folder structure and that, uh, I don't know what the result of that was, but um, it's kind of like if you go with stock Jenkins, it's really not much effort. Okay, well it works with the folder stuff and I really don't even know what that means, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, something else I, that uh, came up, um, I'll mention that and then get to your question, is um, I've actually had a chat with some of my teammates when they're like, you know, there's, there's two kinds of artifacts that get published to repositories in a sense. There's, uh, I'm, I'm a library developer, like, a, you know, build spring libraries. Those get published to Artifactory. It's like, versus I'm building an app that runs that my clients connect to. That I'm going to publish to Artifactory. And those are two different concepts. Um, this is more the ops oriented. I want to publish an application that my clients are going to use. The, my deployment process to put it in production is more complex than publishing to Bintray, or it's more complex than just putting it out in a milestone repository. If, if you're building an artifact that somebody else is going to consume as a Maven resource, this is probably not the tool you're looking for. This is overkill in that sense. But if you're deploying operational applications that are cloud native, you're deploying microservices that run your system that, you know, that has a third of the internet traffic going to it, then this is the tool for you that lets you get your arms around it and maintain control of what the heck is going on. So, yeah? Okay. So the question is, uh, after a deployment step, does Spinnaker watch it to see what's going on, like to help recover it? Um, they essentially have the, we were talking about the, they have different health checks you can pick from. You can either say, I'm going to depend on the cloud platform to tell me whether or not it's up. And that's essentially if you do, when you do a CF push from the command line, you get back either it, it succeeded or failed. And that's the one check that you have. The other one is, is the health check is based on, my app is using Spring Cloud Netflix. It hooks into Eureka, and when it reports an up status through Eureka is when it really is up. And that's the other feature that they brought up that Spinnaker can also talk to Eureka and use that as its, as its health check. Now, if the, if the outcome is, is I did a deployment and it failed, the, the staging has a timeout threshold, which it's going to eventually time out. Like if, it, if you deployed a bad app and it crashes, the, the provider cannot bring it up. No, uh, so the question is, well, what if, it, what if it initially reported up that it was good and then later the app crashed, what does Spinnaker do? And in that sense, Spinnaker doesn't do anything because its mission was to deploy it and see that it goes up. Its job is not to actually monitor it after the fact and keep it up. That's what the cloud, that's what your platform is supposed to do by itself. So if it got up and for whatever reason, maybe out of memory, disk space full, that's, that's, that's after the scope of what the pipeline does. And so it's not its responsibility. Okay, so the question is, is um, you know, when you do the CF apps, you can, you, you're able to leverage manifest files for, for Cloud Foundry based apps. And uh, I've been asked that question like, I think two times or something about, you know, do you, essentially does it support manifests? And I found out manifests are, in my personal opinion, are, they're, they're handy for some of the simplest things, but I, I've reached points where I need, I need to do this other operation that's not covered by the manifest solution. And so I, I faced a design choice of, am I gonna support manifests and doing everything outside of manifests, or can I just sidestep the manifest approach? And so essentially, I don't deal with manifests. Um, in this case, you, you, you can list, you know, I need to add each of these services. It's, it doesn't have support today for, um, I need this service, this is actually, this is, this, is P, this is the P Redis tile. If it's, the service isn't there, go create it and then bind it. I don't have support for that today, but you know, enough customer feedback may say, we need that, you know, and then it may be, okay, do we need to have a little more details about, okay, if the service doesn't exist, pick this tile, pick these configurations, is that, you know, that may be something customers ask for, but it's not implemented today. So, 
So, so the thing is, like, if you know, if I, what if I change the version? Do I need to change the services that are related to the pipeline? In that case, you need to go in and um, you may either need to go if if you want to go update the existing pipeline, you can do that to say the you know the next rollout. You know, I need to change what services are being bound to it, like if it's being bound to a different service or something. Or I don't know if that's a reason to say I'm going to disable this pipeline not to do any more uh, deployments, but I'm going to go cut a new pipeline that's aimed at you know whatever the changes are. Those are the kind of options you have. Um, I don't know if that I don't know if that targets your uh, question or not. But we can talk afterwards. We have got about ten minutes left. So wait, what was the example you said there? Um, um, so, yeah, so the question is, can you bind, you know, if you've got binding operations that require arguments, uh, not today, essentially all it's doing is a CF bind service operation with just the logical name of it to the app is what it's doing right now, and I've actually not ever done that before, so, but again, that's another customer feedback, is that what we need? Uh, um, whatever the, essentially we're using CF Java client, so whatever the uh, library that can do that Ben Hale rewrote recently with Reactor, um, you know, we can make visible through the tool, and that way, you know, we can empower the, the users. Um, we got, okay. <laughs> okay, the, the Spinnaker API is something that, uh, um, Netflix built a uh, API, and in its current incarnation, if I understand, it's uh, heavily heavily tied to the AWS aspects of things. And so, uh, Netflix open source Spinnaker, but they have some proprietary stuff that they add to Spinnaker. So when they actually deploy it in their configuration, they they grab the open source bits, they add their uh, proprietary implementation of the Canary API, and that's what they run. The uh, the API itself is. Uh, I think is in progress of being made available, uh, available to other cloud providers to hook into, uh, but that's not available today. And so I kind of used a shortcut to get around that by using a spell expression to call out to an external service. But um, it's nice, I really want that feature because uh, it has a nice UI feature where you can actually see, you know, canary check and get a good readout on that. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, so the question is, what about like, does it gather metrics like on volume of builds and stuff like that? And that absolutely, like everything that everything that Netflix does is like gobs and gobs of metrics collection. It's it's a, it's a description I've heard. It's it's a company that uh, gathers metrics on everything, and it just happens to deliver video. So there's all kinds of code in there that like do this call, wrap it in a metric, you know, gather metrics. Um, so it's all gathered in the system. It's not necessarily served through the UI stuff I was showing you, but the, uh, the metrics are being gathered. So you can go analyze, you know, after the fact what's your, what your status of things. All right, well, thank you, thank you everybody for coming and asking like gobs of questions. So if you wanna keep talking after the fact, you know, you can come find me or definitely go find these guys, so.